I'm going to get the same string in grammar A and the same string in grammar B, and I can connect that to a solution to my post correspondence problem. So I give this grammar and this grammar to my friend who knows how to check for empty intersection. And I say, do me a big favor and tell me if there's any string in common between these two. And they go home with their hypothetical empty intersection algorithm, and they churn and churn and churn, and they come back the next day and they go, yeah, here it is. Here's a string that they both have in common. They do have something in common. Here it is. Then what do I say to the, my post correspondence problem? I say the answer is, yes, there is a string that you can concatenate the A's and the B's together. What if they go home and they say that they have nothing in common? There is no possible string you can generate from SA that matches a string you generate from SB. Well, if you think about SA, SA generates every possible combination of sequences from column A, and SB generates every possible sequence of combinations from SB where the sequences match. So if they have no strings in common, then there's no way at all to solve this problem. We just went ahead and took the post correspondence problem and hid it inside these two grammars. And now my friend who knows how to check whether there's empty intersection between two context free languages can solve the post correspondence problem for me in this backhanded sneaky way. And all I have to do is this little reduction. I gotta take my post correspondence problem, create these two grammars, hand it to my friend, get the answer, and send the answer back to the person who wants the answer to the post correspondence problem. That's a reduction. The reduction is the changing of the input of the hard problem to the input of the unknown problem. And showing that the answer to this is true if and only if the answer to this is true. And that's what we've been doing in this discussion. There are questions about that. That's the first undecidable problem. So you can't do this because it implies that the solution to this and this is impossible. You have to avoid the trivial point that they both generate answers. Oh, yes, right. Um, so it's like a null. We're asking for a null set, not the set. It's just a... Right. I guess that would, my, the person would always come back and say, oh, yes, they always have something in common, epsilon. I have to ask them if they have something in common besides epsilon. Since you're paying them to do something. Yeah, I'm, right. <laughs> right. And you can build that so that epsilon wasn't a possibility, that you had that. To... That's true. In fact, you know, the, the epsilon is really, I really shouldn't have these epsilons here. I really should have. Uh, I could get rid of this epsilon. It's a technicality. Todd's right. The way I have it now, it's not quite right. I need to, to make these epsilons real terminal symbols, but I could do it. I need to, here, it's not so hard to do. Instead of the epsilon, I need to put in one small a, one zero one 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 small b, and one zero small c. I just need to put those out explicitly instead of the epsilon. There shouldn't be epsilons there. I should maybe fix it. 1a, 10111b, 10c. Same kind of thing here. That puts, Isn't that okay? No, because then you'd have, you'd be putting the number at the end, like the letter, you'd be putting numbers at the end of the number string and the letter at the beginning of the. Um, no, it's okay. Oh, is it, I think it's okay. Yeah, they're always throw backwards. Yeah. No, that's perfectly fine. Essentially, what I just did is, is, is get rid of the e-productions. Because I really don't want the e-productions. And I could do the same thing here. And it's a good point. It's, technically, it was really wrong before. All right, questions about this? OK. Let's do another one. These grammars are, are kind of famous, so it's the, it's the bridge between PCP and grammar problems. But now that we've got this grammar problem that's undecidable, we're going to milk this for everything it's worth, and I'll convince you that another grammar problem is undecidable. And then they're all just going to fall like pins, and they're all going to be hard. All right, so let's consider this problem. Um, the problem of L being equal to everything. You go home, and you've got a way to check whether L equals everything. And I'm dying to figure out whether two context-free grammars have something in common. 
I'm going to show you how to solve this problem if you know how to solve this problem. So I'm going to reduce this problem to this problem. PCP reduced to this, and I'm going to reduce this down to this. Now how do I do that? I'm trying to solve this problem using this as a subroutine, basically. Right? That's what I tried to do here. I tried to solve PCP using this as a subroutine. And I assumed that there was some solution to this, and, and I showed you how to do it, and then I know that there's no way to solve this, therefore that subroutine can't exist. So same thing here. I'm going to show you how to solve this if you know how to solve this problem. How do I do it? Here you can make a good guess. Here you don't need this, this jump for a fancy grammar. How do you check if the intersection of two languages is empty, if somebody can tell you if a language gets everything? Let's try something and see if it works. It, that's the way to try, but when we try to use complement before, why, why couldn't we? Why can't we just complement L and check whether L complement equals empty? We know how to check whether a context-free language equals empty, right? So why don't we just take the context-free language, we get complement it, check for empty, and then if that's empty, that'll tell us our original is everything. Well, how come that doesn't just show that this is decidable? It's because when we take the complement, we don't get a context-free language necessarily. We might get a Turing machine. And it is not possible to check whether a Turing machine accepts nothing. That's actually undecidable. So, so that doesn't work, that idea. Well, let's kind of use that idea here because you get this really cool connection of closure properties that make it just work perfectly. Here's what I mean. Somebody knows how to solve this problem. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this intersection, and I'm going to take its complement, and I'm going to give that to them. And if they tell me it's everything, then I'll know the original was nothing. So my, my first step is just take the complement of this. Take L1 intersect L2 complement and give that to the person who knows how to check for everything. And when they say yes, I'll say yes. And if they say no, it's not everything, then I'll know that the original is not nothing. Well, what's the deal here? I just took two context-free languages. I intersected them and took their complement. And I'm implying that I'm resulting in another context-free language. So it's completely unfounded. You can't intersect two context-free languages and get a context-free language. And moreover, you can't complement them and expect another context-free language. Nevertheless, interestingly enough, I'm going to convince you in two minutes that this is definitely a context-free language. It's kind of like two wrongs will make a right. Here's how I'm going to convince you. Let's look at L1 and L2, because they're not just arbitrary context-free languages here, actually. You remember where they came from, from the PCP? There were very specific kinds of languages that this problem was hard for. What do they look like? I'll write it down again. Here's an SA, right? SA goes to 1SAA, 10111SAB, and 10SAC, and then 1A, 10111B, and 10C. Look at this language. Look at this grammar. If you had to make a machine for that, could you make a deterministic one, or do you have to use non-determinism? How would you make a machine that accepts the strings generated by this grammar? What would you do? Let's talk about that for a few minutes. Because what I want to convince you is that these two languages here can be assumed to be deterministic. And if they are, I'm going to be able to convince you that that's going to be a context-free language. But let's think about these languages and make sure that they're really deterministic. What method do we have of coming up with a machine that's going to generate the strings that this, that's going to accept the strings that this language generates? How do you want to do it? Here's a possibility here. You're reading through the string. What are you going to do? What are you going to do with these ones and zeros? You've got a push-down machine at your disposal. What do you want to do? What if we look at 